Good evening and welcome. We're glad you're here to participate in our Good Friday service uh, this evening. Our theme is the final hours, and tonight we'll take you on a journey that will end up at the foot of the cross. The Apostle John writes in his gospel these words, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, he said, It is finished. And with that he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we gather this evening in what is a solemn occasion. These are holy moments as we come to recall once again your suffering for us. These are emotional moments as we recognize that in your suffering you took our guilt and our sin on yourself. And these are moving moments as we picture the fact that all of this was planned, you always knew it was coming, and this was the mission, and you fulfilled it in love. We thank you, Lord, for that kind of love. This evening we rejoice in that love, we reflect on that love, and we seek to live that love out toward one another. Help us to that end, we pray. In your name we ask it. Amen. Testing. Ah, there we go. It's only a test. It was only a test. Above all. Ready? One, two, three, four, one, two. Above all powers. Above all powers. Above all.
Tonight, we are going to look at some of the events that took place during the final hours. <laughs> that led up to the crucifixion of Jesus. Our prayer is that each of us, as we reflect on these events, will not only be reminded of what happened, but will be even more thankful for our Lord and his willing sacrifices for us. We will take a look at the Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane, and the cross. Jesus walked through each of these events knowing what he was going to go through and what was to come next. He also knew that as time went by, he would have less and less earthly support. Notice that in each of these events, there are less and less people with Jesus. At the Last Supper, he was surrounded by his 12 disciples. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there was just Peter, James, and John. And then Jesus went to the cross alone. Before we get to the final hours, let's remember what happened earlier in the week, where Jesus had an entire crowd of people supporting him. As Jesus made his way into Jerusalem on what has come to be known as Palm Sunday, the crowd of people cheered for him and cried out, Hosanna, which means Lord save us. They were enthusiastic because they thought that Jesus was going to save them from the Romans. He was going to provide salvation, but not in the way they were thinking. Hosanna, Lord save us. Thank you. 
is that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It was the calm before the storm, the last few precious moments of peace, fellowship, friendship, and communion. The final exhale before Jesus would change the whole world forever. It had already been an exciting week, a hearty welcome into the city and people shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! While waving palm branches, while cleansing the a religious racket in the temple, and as always, being challenged by the religious leaders. He had told them, his disciples, what was coming. Prepared them as best he could, but they didn't seem to fully grasp what was about to take place or why it needed to. So they had reclined at the table, happy just to be in his and each other's presence and regroup, but Jesus wasn't finished teaching them. As he was known to do, Jesus taught with visuals, mustard seeds, salt, yeast, dough, fig trees, flowers in a field, cities on hills, this particular time was their dinner, the bread and the wine. He would explain his death once more through the Passover meal. The, the bread. bread. His body, take and eat. The, the wine. wine. His blood, drink it, all of you. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. The Passover meal was no longer about just remembering the past but was now looking forward to the future. Satan had already put into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. One of you will betray me. But Jesus still loved him. You will all fall away from me, Jesus told them. The shepherd will be stricken. The sheep will be scattered. Peter answered, I will never leave you. Before the rooster crows, You'll deny me three times. But Jesus still loved him. And even as he was about to go back to his father, he rose, poured water into a basin, and knelt down to wash their feet. He knew. Even then, Jesus knew what was in Judas's heart. He knew all that was about to take place. He knew Peter, one of his closest and dearest friends, would so recklessly betray him. He knew the disciples would flee when everything started to go downhill. He knew that all of the world's sin would be placed on him. He knew that his final hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. And having loved his own who were here in the world, he loved them to the end. He, he knew. knew even as the one who had every right to claim the space of honor, be literally worshiped and admired, chose to take the place of a servant. He washed their feet. The King of Kings. The Prince of Peace. Washed their feet.
found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. They had finished the Passover meal, and as Jesus was known to do, he went to the Mount of Olives to pray. The disciples didn't understand. They failed the test. After all Jesus had done, after all they had seen, miracle after miracle, healing the sick, making the lame to walk, casting out demons, walking on water, feeding thousands of people with a small lunch twice, commanding the wind and the waves and the storms. And still, they just didn't get it. The disciples didn't understand. They failed the test. After all Jesus had done, after all they had seen, miracle after miracle. Healing the sick. Making the lame to walk. Casting out demons. Walking on water. Feeding 10,000 people with only a small lunch twice. Commanding the wind and the waves and the storms. And still, they, they just, just didn't, didn't get, get it. it. He had a simple request. Be watchful with me. Be watchful and pray. He was grieved in agony. The weight of the world on his shoulders. His sweat was like great drops of blood falling on the ground. The time for Jesus to completely fulfill his purpose on earth was at hand. The anticipation of the physical pain of torture and death on a cross is enough to drive anyone into a deep state of distress. But the heaviness of carrying all mankind's sin, of being separated from God the Father, was overwhelming. overwhelming. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, 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 your will be done, not mine. And when he had finished praying, he went to the disciples. There was a great heaviness over them as well, but they slept. Wake up, Jesus had said. Wake up. 
and pray so temptation doesn't overtake you. But even as Jesus said this, a crowd showed up with swords and clubs, ready for a fight. Judas, one of the twelve, approached Jesus and kissed him on the cheek, betraying the Son of Man. As they seized Jesus, Peter took out a sword and cut the ear off one of the men. Jesus said, Put away your sword. Don't you know that I can appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve uh, legions of angels? But God's only son, still with every breath, every intention, every drop of blood, chose the way of the humble servant king, the obedient son of God the Father. They arrested Jesus and took him away. All the disciples left him and fled, running for their lives. Time and time again, throughout all scripture, people chose to run away from God. Even after God showed himself faithful and loving, they fled. In the beginning, God created us to be with him, to walk with him. And when mankind chose to disobey God and sin, he started to run. We ran and we tried to hide. And ultimately, sin led us to death and being cast out of God's presence. But God, who loves us beyond comprehension, made a way for us to stop running and start living in his presence. He created a system of sacrifices, a way for his people to atone for their sins. There were rules and laws and procedures. It was a small price to pay to be anywhere near him. We are unworthy and deserve death and eternal separation from God, but God is rich in mercy. He sent us a rescuer a redeemer, the final sacrificial lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Isaiah said, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. And he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and they shall bear his iniquities.
Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. It is finished. Then they made him carry his own cross up the hill, where they laid him out and drove long nails into his hands and feet. His cross was raised and secured in a place, and there Jesus hung for all to see. The message was sent. Defy us and suffer the consequences. Jesus' disciples didn't understand. They wanted a conquering hero. They expected a savior who would ride in and slay the Romans and free them from the tyranny of the government. Instead, they got a simple man from a backwoods town who preached love and forgiveness. All hope was lost. Their savior, the Messiah, the one they waited 400 years for, had died. He could have called it off. Right then and there, he could have saved himself and ended all his pain and suffering. But it was love that kept him there for me and for each of you. Could it really have come to this? Will those who love him and those who lash him and those who trapped him and those who will wash their hands of him and those who have denied him and those who have betrayed him ever understand all the prophecy about him and why this had to be. The prophet Isaiah spoke of it. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our inequities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed.
This evening I want to share some thoughts with you from Matthew chapter 27. Because in that passage we see that while Jesus is hanging on the cross, shedding His blood so that we might be forgiven, some remarkable, outstanding, outrageous things happen around Him. Darkness covers the land. The temple curtain is torn in two. An earthquake shakes the ground and splits open graves. Here's how Matthew tells it. Matthew 27, starting in verse 45, From the sixth hour unto the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out and again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook The rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Three of those events, for sure, happened during Christ's crucifixion. The fourth, the people who were formerly dead coming back to life, There's some debate as to whether that happened on Friday or on Resurrection Sunday. I'll explain that in a moment. But in each of these events, fascinating, amazing things are taking place, enough to shake up the sensibilities of anybody in the city. No wonder after the resurrection, when Jesus meets the two walking on the road to Emmaus, he asks them, what are you talking about? And here's their reply. Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? In other words, what else would we be talking about? Everyone knew what was going on. Jesus' crucifixion, but beyond that, these events, front page news, and everyone was affected by them. They all felt the earthquake that damaged the graves. They all were caught up in the darkness. They all heard the rumor that came from reputable sources. The temple curtain, the inner curtain, was ripped from top to bottom. And by that time on Sunday, they had seen dead people walking around. What would it be like to witness these events? And why do these things happen? First of all, the darkness from noon to 3 p.m. That's the period of time that Matthew describes. Full daylight is obliterated. The setting is that Jesus has been on the cross now for three hours when the darkness came. He was on the cross at 9 a.m. And all of a sudden, when you're looking for midday sun and you're feeling, you're expecting to feel midday heat, what you find is darkness. A Roman astronomer named Phlegion, who lived during this time, wrote about it. He said this, The greatest eclipse of the sun that was ever known to happen happened then, for the day was so turned into night that the stars appeared. See, this is not twilight. We're talking about a thick, crushing darkness, a blackness, midnight at noon. Now that's going to get your attention. And with all due respect to the Roman astronomer, And to many who down through the ages have tried to cast this as nothing more than a coincidental eclipse, we know that whatever happened there, it was not an ordinary eclipse. It was not a run-of-the-mill where the moon gets in the way of the sun eclipse. Why? This is Passover. Passover is held in the full moon. When the moon is farthest away from the sun, something special is happening here. And the darkness lasted for three hours. My point is, this is an action of God, a direct willful intervention. God is blotting out the light of the sun to get our attention. 
And what is he saying? He's telling us of the true character of Jesus. Light is taken away. All throughout the Scriptures, light is an important symbol. It's an image associated with that which is pure, that which is moral, that which is holy and right. When Jesus came into the world, the Magi were led to find Him by the light of a star. Paul calls Christians children of light. Peter says that we have been called out of darkness into the wonderful light. And Jesus says of Himself in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. And Jesus' declaration of himself as the light means, I am the source of what is pure. I am the deliverance from what is evil. I am the example of what is holy. I am the revelation to show you salvation. And when he died, God the Father confirmed it with a message of darkness. The light of the world has gone out for a while. And then the temple curtain was split from top to bottom that inner curtain that separated the holy of holies from the holy place and the sanctuary of the temple. The holy of holies was that place that represented the throne room of God, symbolizing the presence of God with His people, separated at this point by a huge uh, curtain. No one went into the holy of holies except the high priest and then only once a year, the Day of Atonement, because that curtain was a symbol that God is separate and God is holy and that sinful human beings cannot be in His presence. And remember, this is Passover Eve. The temple sanctuary would be a busy place. The temple courts would be packed. The sacrifices were being made. And God Himself ripped that curtain open. And the symbolism is clear. The way to God is now open. All the rituals, all the sacrifices, all the blood that at that very moment was flowing out at the altar, that system was now coming to an end. The function of the high priest was no longer needed, not the human high priest. You don't need an intermediary to go to God. The way is made. And then the earthquake, the rocks split and the ground shook. God is telling us creation itself shudders in sorrow. This is the worst thing that humanity has ever done, killing the innocent Savior and killing the Creator. And the creation responds, an innocent is dying. The thief on the cross saw it. Luke, in in chapter 23, Tells us the thief said, we are punished justly for we are getting our, what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. That is the heart of the gospel. Those words are telling you much more than that thief really knew what he was saying. Jesus was the only one who truly did nothing wrong ever, yet he took on our guilt. That's the gospel. But let's not generalize the concept of sin It was our guilt, it was our sin that put him there. The Dutch painter Rembrandt has painted a dark and foreboding picture of the crucifixion. When you look at it, your eyes are drawn immediately to the cross, and that's the intention of the painting. But if you were to take the time to scan the edges of that painting, you would find that Rembrandt painted himself in the crowd. It's a statement. It was for my sin that he went to the cross. But then as we read on, things get very remarkable. Verse 52, the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now that could be confusing. I want you to remember something. The early ancient manuscripts in the original language, in this case Greek, that we translate into English, those manuscripts have no punctuation. So when the translators bring that that, uh, text into English, they have to add the punctuation to gain the meaning of the passage. And so there's a punctuation issue here in this passage. I think the English Standard Version, the ESV, does it best. It puts it this way. 
The ESV creates a standalone sentence. The tombs were opened, period. And then a new sentence. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I think that's a better rendering. And I re the reason I do that is because I don't believe that Na Matthew is necessarily meaning to tell us that the people were raised to life on Friday at 3 p.m. and stood around by their tombs to Sunday morning and then wandered into the city <laughs> or wandered around the countryside scaring the locals. I don't, I don't think so. I think that the tombs were broken as a natural consequence of the earthquake. That alone would get your attention, right? But then a very unnatural event took place. They came out of their tombs and after Jesus' resurrection went into the holy city and appeared to many. It could be that it's almost like when Jesus is raised from the dead, there is a resurrection power that flames forth. And the formerly dead righteous people wander the streets of Jerusalem for a time. There's a lot of questions there. And when we get to glory, we're going to ask some questions about this. <laughs> but here's what we know. We know they were recognizable. We know they were known to be righteous by the people who lived that, in that day. We know they were known to be dead. And we know they were walking around. And the message is clear. Death is defeated. The darkness shows us that the light of the world is extinguished for a time. The torn curtain shows us that the pathway to the holy is now open. The earth shakes at the prospect of the suffering of the Creator. But in the end, life comes, supernatural, and death is defeated. And you put it all together, and God is telling us how we must feel about this event. He's putting an exclamation point on the whole thing. He's saying to us, this is a bitter day. But I always have foreseen it. My only son is dead. Tonight is a night of darkness, but it was the plan of God to experience the darkness in our place. It's a bitter day. But the plan of God, unstoppable and, and sovereign, is ultimately a plan for victory because the darkness will recede and resurrection is the result. So now we weep and now we wait and now we remember what He has done for us. Would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, we thank You for Your sacrifice. We can't imagine, we can't imagine not only the physical agony, but the spiritual agony of being forsaken by eternal God the Father who, with whom you had fellowship for all eternity past. We can't imagine the amount of love that carried you to that cross and the agony you experienced, but we are so thankful for your sacrifice. And Lord, we thank you that you call us to remember, and as we remember, we replay in our minds the riches that is ours because of your love. Thank you, Lord. We rejoice in all that you give us. And as we move to a time of communion together, for those who know you, for those who love you and are walking with you, as we partake, we do so in a state of reverence, thankful for everything you are to us. In your name we pray, amen. Tonight we will celebrate communion at stations. Some of you are, have been already asked to help uh, hand out the communion elements, and if that's you, I'm going to ask you to move to your station right now as I introduce this. As they do that, let me explain that we will view a music video in a moment that takes us to the themes of the cross. And during that time, we ask you simply to quietly prepare yourself to partake in the communion elements. And then when you feel ready to go to the table nearest you and you'll be given the communion elements, you can take them right there or return to your seat and partake. 
If the, if the table nearest to you has a long line and you wish to go to a one that's not so long, that's fine. But as we prepare to move to the tables of remembrance, the cross of Christ reminds us of something, and that is that we should never judge a moment too soon. What looked like defeat was the wonderful victory over sin. God the Son in the flesh was publicly killed and humiliated. It's the worst injustice in human history, but it is also an example of grace in action. His extreme suffering made a way for us to escape suffering. One author put it this way, the very worst thing that could ever happen was at the very same time the very best thing that could ever happen, and only God is able to do such a thing. At the same, and that same God is your heavenly Father. That same God rules your life. And so I say, do not judge your moments too soon. What looks to you like now, like right now is a disaster, may actually be grace working itself out. Listen to the words of the prophet once again. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. Thank you that you turned an instrument of death, the cross, into an emblem of love. We rejoice in that. In your name we pray. Amen. When you are ready as the video plays, Go to the table of remembrance.
Let's pray together. Jesus, keep us near the cross because near the cross we know our worth. Near the cross we see your love for us. Near the cross there is an exclamation point. Grace is victorious. Sin can be forgiven. A new start is possible. And near the cross we find we are on common ground with one, an- with one another. You wipe away the distinction of race and language and ethnicity. You unite us as one people, your people. For who we are is who you say we are. We learn that near the cross. Amen. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And this was the method. It was bloody, horrible, painful, agonizing to bear and terrible to watch. This was the method. But in all of this, God is doing something wonderful because this is not the end of the story. There's more to come. Let's watch the screens together. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like Sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirits burning. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands God, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. 
Sunday is a coming.
Amen. Hey, would you show your appreciation for the choir and the orchestra, the band? Let's say thank you to the media team up in the booth there. Thank you, guys. Our skilled narrators down here. All right, great job. And give it up for Lorraine. She did a wonderful job. Pray with me before you go. Lord Jesus, you have the final word. We rejoice in that. Help us, Lord, live according to your word, follow your word, and cling to your word. Go with us as we are dismissed this evening. Bring us back on Sunday morning ready to rejoice the defeat of death together. Help us do that, we pray. In your name we ask it. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming tonight.